presented in direct language, easy to follow. But let, let me just say that uh, Metro is uh, unique in the United States. It isn't like the other 26 transit systems around the country. Um, it, as Ms. Norton pointed out, it's governed by three jurisdictions. Um, and, and it's funded essentially, operationally, in two ways. Fare box recovery by users, the highest in the United States. So they're already paying more than their fair share. And secondly, by subsidies by the local jurisdictions. My taxpayers in Fairfax County, Congressman Van Collins' taxpayers in Montgomery County, and Eleanor Holmes Norton's taxpayers in D.C. Not a dime of federal subsidies for operational purposes. So if we're going to have expanded federal oversight of safety or any other aspect of Metro, then the federal government has to be at the table with operational dollars. Mr. Micah is right. Otherwise, we have an unfunded mandate. We have the federal government setting new standards and putting on new burdens and new requirements, all of which may be good ideas, but not funding them. And uh, that therein lies the problem with Metro. Because for a long time, long before Mr. Rogoff got the job, the federal government has been retreating from its responsibilities with respect to transit in America and especially with respect to this metro. We move 40 percent of the federal workforce every day. No other transit system in America does that. We bear the burden of 12 to 14 million American and other tourists coming to visit the nation's capital because we are the seat of the federal government. No other transit system in the United States does that. And local governments are expected to subsidize that through their subsidy programs. And so one of the things missing at the table is the federal government with operational dollars. We finally made progress for the federal government providing capital dollars in a matching program. And that's great. That's real progress. But I feel very strongly that the federal government can't have it both ways. If we're going to set new standards, if we're going to put new burdens, all of which may be justified on Metro, then the federal government has to provide operating dollars. And I think it ought to anyhow because of the unique relationship with Metro. And I know that some might say we already provide operating subsidies in the form of smart subsidizing fares for federal workers who use it. That's a subsidy for our workforce. That's not a subsidy. That's not an operating subsidy for Metro itself. Um, and uh, because actually it serves our interest as a federal government to have those people using Metro every day. And we saw the importance of that relationship uh, in the recent blizzard when Metro could not function above ground. We had to shut down the federal government for four and a half days. So the relationship is vital, essential. There's no turning back. And we might as well recognize that relationship. Mr. Rogoff, let me ask you, if I can, three questions. One, 21 thoughtful recommendations. What would it cost to implement those recommendations? Any we, cost estimate? Uh, we would not, but I'm, I'm glad you raised that issue because I have to say that when you look deep down in some of those recommendations, issues like communication and, and parts of WMATA working at cross purposes, um, I do not believe that all those recommendations are about money. I don't believe all those solutions bear a cost. I think it's about focus. It's about how serious the safety challenge is taken by all lines of business and how Metro is organized. So, but, but you have no cost estimate. I mean, certainly it's going to cost something. Some of the things may cost something in terms of, you know, if we've asked the talk to strengthen its personnel uh, at the tri-state oversight, obviously those, that, that bears some salary costs for those additional personnel. But ag again, I think a, a lot of the more immediate audit findings of, of what has troubled us on the safety performance at Metro are not cost issues. They're, they're, they're performance organization and focus issues. Yeah, I, I, I agree with some of that, but I mean, I think it also involves dollars. Uh, Metro is starving for dollars in terms of operating costs and bumping up against limits on both subsidies and fare box recovery. Let me ask you if it's possible to ask the agency to go back and, and look at this issue of, well, we're, all right. We're, we're happy to look and see if we're, where we identify a specific Good. cost for the response. Good. Okay. Um, secondly, governance structure. Uh, I've read with great interest some uh, interesting uh, editorials in a local newspaper about how parochial the governing structure is. Uh, the notion that uh, Maryland, D.C., and Virginia 
have this uh, odd and quixotic notion that elected officials from those jurisdictions or appointed officials from those jurisdictions ought to actually have some say over how their local tax dollars are being used to subsidize Metro. Um, have you looked at the governance structure and are there recommendations for how it might be improved, streamlined, or made more efficient? We, we did not, as part of our audit, specifically take on the issue of the governance structure. However, I will say this. Um, we, 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 ha we do have some concerns as it relates to the governance structure of the talk, and the talk sort of mirrors what's going on with the WMATA board, and that is that you've got a rotating chairman that, that changes every year, and all three jurisdictions have to agree on everything. You know, the way uh, uh, I would say this, uh, we, we do have concerns over what, what has sometimes been described as the mutually assured destruction single agency, single jurisdiction veto of, of the Metro Board. It makes it very hard to make very difficult funding decisions. So, so you had mentioned in your opening remarks that, that Metro has very high fare box recovery. That is true on the rail side. It is not necessarily true on the bus side. Um, and if we're going to address the overall budget on the whole, everything needs to be looked at. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me I know my time is up. I, I want to echo what Mr. Rogoff suggested. Um, I also think we have to look at uniform strengthening of rail safety standards so that we all know we're all working from the same book that we can't have 27 different standards for 27 different systems. No wonder we have a problem. I thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Administrator, I, in all fairness to the metro system as a former um, transit operator myself, the bus systems are never have never had the fare box recovery that, that mm -hmm. rail does. No, absolutely. Um, okay, we just want to clarify that. Let me, let me just say that I'm going to dig into one little aspect, and I, and I think it's more important to talk about this one aspect and see how the systems respond to that. How many systems do we have in this country right now that are automated, um, oper uh, automated operation with manual override? It's relatively few. Um, and, and most of those are, are shorter segments that aren't citywide systems. They're, they're sometimes point to point. I'd have to get you that for the record. Yeah, I, when I came here in, in 95, this set up a red flag for me as a former operator because in 1980 when we implemented our rail system, we were specifically told by experts that the system that was um, automatic with the manual override was worse than having no, no automation at all. That it was a warning that it was a system designed by an engineer sitting in an office, not uh, um, designed by an operator who had actually had real life experience. And we specifically went to the manual operated with a automated override, much like w what you're proposing with the uh, positive train operation. And my concern is, if we knew about in 1980 that this problem came in, and just to my colleagues, is think about this. You spend eight hours a day doing nothing but waiting for something to happen, and you do that for years on end. When something happens, there is no way your response time is going to be quick enough to stop the situation. When we talk about people texting, when we talk about them being on the phone, they're not doing anything because you've designed a system that was designed to design the, uh, the operator out of the process. And then you want the operator to be in the process at a split second at a certain time. It is totally counterintuitive to human nature. But we continue to operate systems like this. Uh, I'd agree with you, sir, that the whole issue of, of operator engagement, fatigue, sleep apnea, and, and what, how we keep the operator engaged in, in, in their task is a very important area for, for not only research, but, but a real hard look by some of these agencies. It is, it is a concern, and the NTSB has spoken to it also. Well, Mr. Operator, you don't have to go very far. I mean, Mr. Administrator, you don't have to go very far. You go right down with the tram between here and the Capitol. You have an individual working a switch with an automated override in case they, they don't back that switch off. But at least when something's wrong, the attention is there, the focus is there, and if there's a problem, they will know very quickly. i am just got to say that what worries me is where has the entire safety um, oversight in this country been since 1980 when those of us in the system knew that this, this whole assumption that some, you know, excuse me, expert engineer who probably never drove a train in their life 
designed this perfect system that was, that was designed to eliminate the operator and then include the operator there for a false security that really doesn't work. How, can we, how have we allowed that to happen over the last 20, 30 years? Well, I think you, 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 you've correctly identified that in the interest of trying to develop fail-safe systems, they have, they've tried to eliminate the risk posed by the human factor. Uh, and sometimes when you eliminate that human factor, you also uh, eliminate the attentiveness of that human. And, and, and this is an area that I, I, I know in our, our research and, and, and uh, innovation office within DOT, they are looking at on a, and on a mode-wide basis, and maybe we can have uh, that administrator, Peter Appel, come up and talk to you about what we're trying to find out there. Okay, I just, I think that what we did is we tried, we, we saw the human factor as being the weak link in the process, rather than that technology was the answer all the time. But instead of taking the positives of both, we took the negatives of both, that when an automated system fails, there is no way for the operator to respond, where in fact, if we had put the operator control with the backup of automation, there's a capability that automation does not get fatigued, does not get in a pattern. Automation can respond in time. And we've literally allowed some nerd in a back room, because he's got a PhD, to design a system that doesn't work in the real world. And I worry about that, that in the federal system, our safety system didn't operate in the real world because we didn't nip this and say up front to everybody what I was told as a young, you know, designer of a, a, a transit system, don't follow these guys down this road. This is a system that is not based in reality and it will kill people. So I, I've got to say, Mr. Chairman, when I saw the accidents here, it hit right on my first reaction was this is exactly the system was designed to do this. These accidents were designed into the system, but somewhere down the way, our process did not re engineer the process and make them change to the positive. Thank you. I appreciate it. I, I, I just said, I, I believe Jackie Jeter is testifying on the next panel. She represents the rail operators, and I think she'd probably have more real life information to share with you on that than I can. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> the, um, this is a dysfunctional system, isn't it? It needs work, urgently. You know, as I listen to um, your testimony, I, you know, it seems to me it's a wonder if it, if uh, we're able to get the kind of results we need at all, because it seems like the right hand doesn't know what the head or the left hand is doing. Is that a fair description? Uh, I would make this observation. Um, when I had a sit down with, um, we, we have a great deal of concern about the, our audit specifically focuses on the lack of communication between the safety department and other departments. In conversations with, with, with Metro leadership, that communication problem is not limited to the safety department. Mm -hmm. There are other right hands and left hands that aren't talking. And that's a, that's a, that's a very big problem, especially given the intensity of service that this system has to turn out every day. And what do you think that's all about? Um, you know, you heard Mr. Micah's, um, uh, and I sit on the Transportation Committee also, and Sir. you heard Mr. Micah's opposition to the bill. Let's assume for the moment that the bill is not going to get through anytime soon, although I'd like to think otherwise. But I also want to be realistic. I'm trying to figure out, and of the 21 recommendations, you said that not all of them cost money, which I agree. What, I mean, I'm just trying to figure out how do we get to where you've got to go? What are you trying to get us? Let's assume the legislation doesn't pass. Well, how do we get there? Well, I think importantly and sadly, you've got a lot more focus on this problem after an accident than obviously that you did beforehand. So I'd like to, because I want to be an optimist on these things, represent that the local jurisdictions and the Tri-State Oversight Committee, even with its extraordinary limited authority, will be able to turn things around as I think Peter Benjamin and Rich Sarles have, have committed publicly to doing. It is. As I said, as, as a daily rider of the system, the thing that spooks me most 
are these communication issues, these stovepipe issues, and, and, and something that isn't in our audit, but I've now heard from enough people that I feel comfortable voicing it here. And that is that there's some real bl bad blood and hostility between some operating departments. And that's a very, very dangerous uh, environment in which to be running uh, our rail and bus operations. So I think an important focus of what, what needs to get us where we're going is, is, is new metro management needs to identify that for what it is, pierce through it, and if people all up and down the chain still want to voice hostility and not work together as a team, then, then maybe they should go find their new team somewhere else and bring in people that are prepared to work as a team to focus on the problem. Do you realize what a sad commentary you, you just made? Do you uh, realize how sad that is? I, I do, sir, but the audit speaks for itself. Uh, th th these are not it's chilling. Light, light hearted findings. The, um, so basically, what we're talking about are, uh, aside from all the things that you've dealt with in your audit, you're also talking about. Um, probably a morale issue. Clearly. And something, and a leadership issue. And I'm not saying present leadership because I know it's new and all that, but, and, you know, it's so sad that we would, you know, you can have all the rules and the regulations you want, but if you don't have people who are committed to the mission, because I think when you're committed to the mission, a lot of that small stuff Falls and sweating away. it goes away. And it's sad. It, it's really sad. So how do you, so you're saying you almost have to start from, from scratch. I think you need to start from the top, the bottom, and the middle. And, and let me just give you an example. I think you put your, your uh, you kind of hit the nail on the head when you talk about morale and what is it that the workers see when they report a safety concern up the chain. Does anything ever come back? When we talk about establishing safety management systems, not just at WMATA, but in every rail transit system through our legislation, it's about having an environment where every uh, set of eyes and ears at the transit agency is focused on safety and is reporting issues up, and there are people who are analyzing that information and finding out where the safety vulnerabilities are and addressing them first. But if you've been working on the right-of-way for a dozen years and in the last three years every concern you raise doesn't get an answer, in some cases it's even worse because in some cases the transit agency addresses their problem but doesn't tell you that they've addressed the problem. So you don't even know that they've addressed it and it, and it turns into a real uh, morale buster in terms of if, if middle management and senior management isn't caring about safety, why should I? And last, just last thing, Mr. Chairman, and then it becomes like a cancer. Absolutely. Because the people, new people come in and say, well, why are you working so hard? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so you got a problem. And the people suffer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Rogoff. I, I just think in response to Mr. Cummings, you referred to bad blood between uh, some of the different groups at, at WMATA. And before we bring up the last panel, I think it's in the interest of the, the public record that you uh, elaborate just briefly. I think we'd all benefit, and I think WMATA would benefit, because this is a very important issue uh, that, we, that was brought up. So if you could just briefly elaborate so that the uh, I'll elaborate a little bit, but out of fairness, I need to say that these observations that have been made to me have been anecdotal. Uh, and that is, uh, especially when it comes to these issues of right-of-way safety, you've got different workers uh, working in different crafts and really a, a common rule of thumb when you've got people working on the right of way with with moving trains is everyone has to get a comprehensive safety briefing and know where everyone is at all times uh, and 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 the observation has been made to me again anecdotally that folks are not making that extra effort it really shouldn't be an extra effort it should be a fundamental effort and, and that is for lack of caring on um, between departments as to who's on the right-of-way crew versus who's, who the operators are. Uh, it, it's a concern that, you know, that's the most critical safety example, but I think that there are other examples. Let me give you one that was in our audit. When the safety department has come around to other operating departments and says, we need to audit your safety department, 
They've had their own authority questioned. Why do we need the safety audit? What do you know about it? And, and that, that's, that's a kind of a form of dysfunctionality that, that can't be allowed to persist. Sure. If, if I can just interject, there's another aspect here we don't even talk about, and, and that is getting the policymakers before construction to be looking at the safety. The policymakers, when you're talking about doing alignment, <clears throat> good example is alignment. Let's talk about the, the metro when it goes over through Alexandria. How many times when a policymaker on the board decides to go with an engineering that's an elevated platform, are they informed and, and sensitized to the fact of the increased risk of maintenance on elevated platforms as opposed to ground level or underground? That kind of thing needs to be interjected not just when you're doing the operation, but when you're designing the program, when you're deciding right of all of this needs to be front loaded so it's, you're not trying to make do afterwards. Mr. Bilbay, we completely agree. And indeed, our current regulations ask the states to set up a state where you're introducing a rail transit system in a state for a first time. We ask the states to establish their state safety office so they could be in conversation with the designers of the system rather than just come in on the first day of operation. I will tell you, because of our limited authority, we have sometimes had to really pull some teeth to get the, the, the governors to stand up to that responsibility. And I want to point out, it's even to the point of alignments, because sometimes alignments require certain type of um, construction that it is not as safe as others. So it's, it needs to be a consideration right from the get-go before you even decide where the line's going to go. Th thank you. Uh, thank you for testimony, Mr. Thank you, sir. Now we're going to bring up uh, the next panel. Uh, Mr. Sarles, Mr. Benjamin, Mr. Bassett, Ms. Jeter, and Mr. Albert. One of the biggest problems with, remember the monorail was going to be the big fancy thing? Yeah. Maintenance safety, maintenance on, on elevated platforms. Is a nightmare. Is that right? Absolutely.